everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Paul Forbes with Dennis's 70s. Today we're talking about growing cactus and succulents indoors. I've got a really fun selection of very colorful and assorted succulents and a couple of cactus to um, talk for you today. <clears throat> I will mention, as it's probably pretty obvious, I am wearing a mask today and that's because COVID is back. Here in the Portland area, we definitely have a lot of cases rising and I'm going to go see my mother in just a few days um, for a family vacation, so I'm taking no risks. If uh, you're turned off by the mask, then turn off right now because um, this is what we're gonna do today. <clears throat> when I think about growing succulents and cacti, indoors especially, I think about, well, <clears throat> I think first about a babysitter that I had when I was a very, very, very young child. Her name was Mrs. Hersher. She uh, was, she lived nearby. She lived in a little trailer and her trailer window sills were all covered with tiny clay pots of assorted cactus, mostly cactus. And as a child, I couldn't not want to touch them. I don't know what it is about the spiny, you know, the little thorns on a cactus, the prickles, the whatever you want to call them, the spines. Um, we want to test them and see how sharp they are. It just seems like um, something that's hard to resist. I've got limited cactus on my table today because um, as I touch and move and show things off, I really want to avoid ending up with a bunch of spines in my fingers. I will talk about how to um, protect yourself when repotting a spiny cactus at some point today, but um, just know that the different types of cactus, even some that look like they barely have any thorns at all, can really have lots of lots of little thorns that just um, uh, spikes, you know, stick in your fingers that you can just barely see until you're like feeling them snag on your shirt or something like that. So, as I mentioned in Mrs. Hersher's trailer, all of her cactus were in the window sills. Now, the most critical aspect of growing indoor succulents and cactus. The most critical is how much light you can provide for the plants. People always want to talk about watering and, you know, how low maintenance these plants are. Well, that's true. They're relatively hands off when it comes to your involvement with fertilizing and watering and repotting. But if you do not provide the plants in this category with bright, and in some cases, even direct bright light, they are not going to thrive. Your watering schedule will have to be strictly adhered to, and they won't necessarily achieve even the, you know, amazing succulentness that they could, the colors that they would, the flowering that they should unless you give them supplemental lighting, for example, in your home. So some of us simply don't have a home that's properly oriented, for example, facing in the right directions, so to speak. Um, we really need either to be right in the eastern window, less than, I'd say, a foot, a foot or within a foot of an eastern window, about three feet from a western window, so one to three feet from a western window. And then that southern window again is where most of these plants even need to gravitate towards come winter time because the sun sinks so low in the sky that when they're in the house in the winter with short days and limited light, we need to give them like the absolute best chance of light as we can, which would be putting them out in the south exposure for that time of year. So it's, you know, they may migrate even in the house unless, like I said, you can actually give them uh, supplemental lighting right where they are in the form of a grow light, a seedling light. Um, those would be your supplemental lights. So lighting is, 
aspect number one. There are some succulents, not necessarily cacti, but there are some succulents that are tolerant of lower light conditions. So we're gonna not say low light, lower light than the bright or the direct. And so succulents that are tolerant of like medium bright light or diffused filtered light would include Haworthias. Um, Haworthias are sometimes I think called a zebra cactus. So you see these really cool zebra stripes that they have on them. They also remind me of like a little crown, um, although that's not gonna help you remember the name Haworthia, I guess. Um, Haworthia, you're gonna remember it? I have no idea. But Haworthias are tolerant of lower light conditions. They are um, stiff and spiky like a cactus or succulent is, but they're not pokey. <clears throat> and again, We'll look back at these Haworthias when we start talking about watering and water needs um, because they have a nice tell. Most of the succulents have a good tell for us um, to be able to figure out when they need to be watered. Another type of succulent that is tolerant of lower light conditions are jade. Um, jade plants in general, um, many of us are familiar with jade plants or have like a jade from a relative. Um, there's a wide variety of jade. So in the genus Crassula, jades can be solid green, kind of the standard old fashioned variety, but we also have colorful jades, including a variegated, so this is a variegated jade called, um, it's just Crassula obliqua variegata. And you can see, so these two jades have actually been out, oh, wow. Are you guys still there? All right. These jades have been outdoors. And so by being outdoors, they really develop some hot, sexy color, pink edges on this one here. This guy is so variegated that it's even got a like ivory white rosette. <clears throat> and then what this jade's even showing us, which we'll revisit in a minute, is that it's dropped a leaf. I'll take this tag out for a minute. It has dropped a leaf and the leaf is growing more jades. So amazing, the amazing feat of what a succulent can do. Um, totally broken down becomes a miracle rebirth. So um, again, a great lesson that we can learn from jades, but we will revisit that in a little bit. So that very good jade, and here's one more, stay close, one more really beautiful jade. And this is the large red jade. So more sunlight on the large red jade makes all of this beautiful red coloration come out. And I'll show you the other side of this jade because this has been sitting and getting afternoon sun just like this. Now, look how green the backside is. So that is a true indication of the difference that you'll see on a plant such as this that's grown indoors for example, you're going to have like red tips, red edges, but a primarily green plant. If you can give it an outdoor summer vacation, it gets a tan, basically. And then that will hold kind of into the rest of the season. Um, I mean, it slowly fades as it comes back inside, but that coloration really is brought out by brighter, brighter light and even direct sun conditions like this plant has been. So we'll talk again about bringing those indoor succulents out for a little while to give them some color and um, just how to approach that as well. So lighting and light conditions, they don't just make or break the plant, they affect the watering, frequency and how much the plant uses for water and also help enhance color. And then the last thing that the bright enough light does for our succulents, sorry, I don't want to lean on these guys, is it actually encourages them to bloom. So we get stimulated bloom stalks with bright, bright light. On this little cutie, which is a Senecio, we've got these daisy-like looking flowers that are coming out on this long, thin stem. And most succulent flowers are short-lived, but highly attractive to pollinators. 
And when this is finished blooming, which we still have a lot of buds left on this flower, when it's finished blooming, we'll just go ahead and snip it off way back down here, kind of close to where it came out of the main plant. Another really cute flower that's kind of in between blooms right now, but you can get the, the gist of the color. This is an Echeveria. This is called Arrow. And that beautiful coral color or orangey flower you can actually see has been blooming for several weeks now as it's continued to flower up the stalk. And now our newest blooms are up high. And if you look at that flower stalk, that is about 18 inches above the main rosette of the plant. So if this weren't in flower, we would see this little clumpy rosette type stalk instead of these big tall stalks. And we also see <clears throat> that the little rosette is sending up a propagation uh, stem as well. So this is a young plant instead of a flower that eventually will either get tall and fill out or get tall and fall over. And when it falls over, then the stem connects to the soil, touches the soil, stimulates roots to grow, and then the plants can sort of like leapfrog almost, you know, it's, it's not like walking, but it's the succulent version of moving along. So very fun variety of flowers. Flowers on succulents are not the main attraction. Um, it's certainly not why we grow succulent plants. Um, except for maybe like the zygo cactus, you know, Christmas cactus, Easter cactus. They're cool. And some of them are really cool. Um, I've recently got a variegated one, which is beautiful. So then you have beautiful foliage as well as when the seasonal blooms come on, you get the flowers. But most of these are cool to look out, look at when they're not in bloom and then flowers are really just an addition. The uh, majority of the cactus and succulent family will bloom once a year or once every couple of years. And um, there are ways that you can actually, like on the zygo cactus, that you can stimulate them to bloom, but there's always kind of a timing, um, which is involving light conditions, changes in temperature, all those types of things, which is how the Easter cactus knows to bloom at Easter and the Thanksgiving cactus knows to bloom in Thanksgiving and the Christmas cactus blooms just a little bit later. Those two sometimes get a little late and early then you don't know, are you Thanksgiving? Are you Easter cactus? <clears throat> but aside from light, which again, I uh, have at this point impressed upon you the importance and the effects that lighting has on cactus and succulents. In addition to lighting, watering is the other kind of plate to spin or you know, ball to, to juggle. When it comes to succulents, part of their nature is they're juicy, right? Succulent, juicy. Um, we could probably look in a thesaurus and find another couple of words that would describe these plants in that they have thick, fleshy, rounded leaves, for example. And this little leaf is full of kind of juices. So if we cut it open, or even just snap it open, like an aloe, we could actually squeeze liquid right out of the plant's cells itself. So this uh, plant stores water in its cells for lean times. When it doesn't have the moisture in its root system, it can reallocate and absorb moisture from the stored uh, water in its leaves. And so we want to give them or simulate desert type conditions or arid conditions for our cactus and our succulents. Although there are some cactus and succulents that come from more tropical regions. So the wide variety, when we talk in generalities like this, um, there's always going to be some weird succulent that is, um, I don't know, more water tolerant or less, like the Howardia, less reliant on bright, bright light. 
<clears throat> but in general, we want to give the succulents and cactus a thorough watering. Think of like a desert thunderstorm. It's intense. The water is, you know, heavy and rushing and, and it, the plants may not see rain again for 90 days. A thorough watering followed by a pretty complete drying out can be helped by the type of soil that you're pot that you're potting into when you're growing succulents and cactus. Now, fortunately, um, you know, soil has come a long way in the 50, 60 years that potting soil has been kind of being manufactured and produced and perfected to the point now where we have specialty blends that are created for faster draining uh, to meet the needs and requirements of succulents and cactus. It <clears throat> comes in a moderate sized bag. So this is our G&B, it's an all organic <clears throat> cactus. This is palm, cactus, and citrus soil, but let me also tell you that it works for succulents, both indoors and outdoors. So also great for succulents and plumerias, if you're a plumeria grower. <clears throat> and again, all organic, fast draining, indoor, outdoor. It's heavy, it's a heavy soil because it does have some sand in it, and, <clears throat> and the sand helps with that drainage. When we <clears throat> need to, <coughs> When we need to assess the watering status of our succulents and our cacti, you could, you could go use a water meter. I know that a lot of people rely on water meters, the little probes that you stick into the soil and they give you kind of a, a needle that'll tell you wet, moderate, dry. They're unreliable. Honestly, a water meter is unreliable and <clears throat> So it's, it's better to use all of the kind of visual signs that you possibly can, as well as, as we do with our indoor, other indoor plants, the basic weight of the plant. Now that's not as easy to gauge if you've got it potted directly into, you know, a clay pot, for example, you've got the weight of the clay container to be able to confuse how heavy or light the plant is. But if you're in a plastic pot and then your plastic pot is just dropped down into a clay pot to display it and grow it that way, then you can grab the plastic pot when you're checking for water and just see how heavy it is. Now, um, this little guy, you can see I can kind of easily lift it with two fingers and also, as you know, I'm very strong. This is a light plant at this point. So um, now we could do another quick check if we wanted and take a look at its root system. Nothing wrong with doing that. It's like popping the hood on your car. How else are you gonna know what's going on under there? So we see that the soil looks uniformly dry. I don't see like a darker band towards the bottom, for example, where maybe there's still some moisture down low. So I've got a lightweight plant. It looks dry, it feels dry, the soil is dry, and now we are going to water it. <clears throat> Similarly, though, on this little Crassula watch chain, it's hard to tell, like, just by looking at it. But if you look at, oh, here's my good example. So this jade, ouch, see, that's why I didn't want too many cactus on my table. This jade here, which is similar to this jade, but can you see on the camera how puckered and wrinkly the leaves are on this little guy here? It's starting to shrivel up because it's using its own moisture. So it's taking away its succulentness by sucking up its own juices and leaving itself as kind of a, a wrinkly old uh, leaf. Shiny, fleshy, firm to the touch, not squishable from side to side. You can't make it into a taco. This is a well-watered, well-hydrated jade, even though it's still lightweight. The soil, I'm sure, is uniformly dry. This guy's not yet, I mean, he's gonna be ready to water soon, but he's not yet pulling moisture away from its own foliage. This one instead, <clears throat> we can 
rolling the leaves into a taco. We can see that puckered look. And it's not like wilting like a, you know, like another plant, a tropical plant, for example. But again, <clears throat> very light colored soil. We can see again uniformity. Ready for a drink. However, I'm always sad to find dead plants, but then on the other hand, it's not common to have like pests and diseases and death at the garden center. So to have an example to show in class, I was like, oh, little guy, your life was not for naught. Um, you're going to teach us all what an overwatered succulent looks like. Some similar symptoms to the very dry one. We see some puckered leaves. Again, kind of shriveled, raisiny looking, puckered leaves, but we also see that the whole plant has wilted. <clears throat> we kind of try to pick it up a little bit. It starts to really begin to fall apart. It is mushy. Now we're really, it's coming, oh, it's all coming apart. We'll also check the roots. Oh, that's quite dark in color. Remember what dry soil looks like? So we can, I can feel that this is a heavy plant. It's, it feels wet, it's heavy. It feels wet to my hands. The plant itself has rotted, which means that it was given water too frequently and not given the chance to dry out. <clears throat> and if we if we just walked along and we saw this plant all smushed, we might just go, oh my gosh, give it a drink and water it, which is just going to like kill it faster. So um, again, making sure that a plant needs water before you water it is critical when it comes to succulents and cactus. <clears throat> now, when you do water it, once it's gotten so dry, Sometimes even the soil sort of pulls away from the pot a little bit. If you just pour water on top at this point, it's going to just run right through. So the well draining soil, the sand and the, all of the ingredients in the soil, sometimes they are hard to re-wet. And it's also very common Many plants in the cactus and succulent genre do not like to get their foliage wet. So you have two reasons to put your plants into more of a bottom watering situation than pouring water over the top to rehydrate them. So bottom watering would be using a tray a bowl. If like this is your one and only plant that you have, you could bottom water it in a teacup or a juice glass or a Dixie cup. What we do in bottom watering is fill our tray with about an inch, half inch or so of water, enough that it's gonna cover the bottom of pots that sit in there. And then we're gonna let it sit until it soaks up enough water that it feels heavy. Yeah, the water. We want it to feel heavy when it has soaked up the water and that may take an hour. That may take even more time depending on the type of plant you have, the size of the container. The smaller pots won't take that long. Let's see if I can do this without spilling. No. So you can see we don't, um, we don't try these things ahead of time. Bottom watering, oh, take a quick look, it's a disaster. Um, but you'll do better at home because of course there's a lot less like spilling of the watering can and all of that. You could bottom water in your bathtub or your sink. Um, just be sure that you don't like clog your drain with dirt. Um, but the oh so popular, oh so commonly misunderstood string of pearls Another beloved and um, slightly finicky 
a member of the succulent family. String of Pearls, which is also a Senecio. Remember who is a Senecio? Senecio here. Little daisy, yellow daisy flowers on this Senecio is the one and only thing that kind of helps us identify that it is in this Senecio family. Because here on String of Pearls, although this guy's flowers are a little further beyond, behind, uh, beyond We've got the tiny little fluff, almost like a dandelion fluff, of the daisy flower of the string of pearls. Um, this one, like I said, is kind of spent, but you can see the relationship there. Now, string of pearls, as a rule, don't like to get their little pearls wet. So uh, this is a plant that truly prefers to be bottom watered. However, I'm not going to water either of these right now because this plant is quite heavy and this one's also on the heavier side and just not ready to be watered. So let's look and see what that looks like. Yeah, so we have <clears throat> lighter colored soil at the top, a little darker at the bottom, a nice root system that goes all the way down there, but I can feel moisture, I can see a darker soil on the bottom and again, the weight of the container all tells me, uh, let's wait a few more days at best before we water this string of pearls again. When we do, we'll set it into a nice dish and let it soak up water from below, then feeling it after oh, 20 minutes, an hour, if 20 minutes it's not heavy enough, give it an hour and then you'll feel it once it's gained all that weight, it's hydrated the soil and that's gonna take it another maybe several weeks or even a month before it gets watered again, depending on the time of year, of course. We water succulents less and cacti less in the winter months than we do in the summer months, not only because plants are growing slower during the winter, but there's also less light and the availability of light is what makes the plants use more water um, as they grow and as it evaporates. So remembering, again, to alter your watering pattern seasonally will help to match kind of the plant's basic growth uh, through the seasons as well. Now, I don't know if I had anything else to show on watering or light. Well, we'll go back to you, fire sticks. Fertilizer, yes. Fertilizer for cactus and succulents can help just stabilize growth, robust foliage, better color. <clears throat> it's generally a liquid fertilizer that we give our succulents and cactus. This is just an easy um, couple of drops into your watering can from uh, our favorite Bonide company, Liquid Cactus Plant Food. 2% nitrogen, 7% phosphor phosphorus, and 7% potassium. So 277, low on the um, green grow juice. So the first number, nitrogen, would make a plant all leafy and um, grow lots of foliage, but we don't necessarily want a cactus to do that. We want them to grow kind of slow and tight and compact. And so that low nitrogen number gives them just enough to, you know, make it, but not, um, not a big, you know, uh, stimulant to grow, grow, grow. <clears throat> it is maybe a monthly um, frequency is kind of good for fertilizing succulents and cactus during the growing season, which again is March through September. So those are the months that you're going to be eating, that the plants will be growing more active but from October through February, we don't to slow your watering frequency. Uh, plants still get to dry out before, before you water them again. <clears throat> it is um, not necessary to provide humidity for your cactus or succulents. Most of these plants uh, are used to arid regions, which includes both dry soil and dry air. We don't, um, we don't need to mist them. They do not need to be in an area with a humidifier. 
although I still wouldn't put them like in direct blow uh, of like a heat vent or an air conditioning uh, vent, we don't want them to have those extreme changes of temperature like constantly. Um, but they are less sensitive to um, dry air in our homes than a lot of our more finicky tropical plants with bigger foliage. Temperatures are another, you know, I mean, if, you th if you've ever been in the desert at nightfall, holy cow, things drop quickly. Uh, your shorts and t-shirt are no longer adequate as the sun goes down. Um, we see a huge swing usually in temperature ranges in desert or arid environments which can go from, you know, almost freezing or even freezing in some cases up to, you know, 100 or even over 100 degrees during the day. So we don't need to be terribly afraid of letting our homes get cool, for example, but we don't want these plants to freeze. And ideally, like 60 degrees is probably their favorite, you know, like don't go, don't, don't go lower than 60 degrees. However, our outdoor succulents so those that perhaps spend like our little crassula friend here that we showed off if this guy spends the winter excuse me spends the summer outdoors getting his tan and getting all vacationed the time frame for bringing it back in is going to be somewhere in mid to late october and that's before we've gotten our average last or average first frost so nighttime temperatures are dipping but they're not down into the 40s or 30s or anything like that. If it starts to rain, that's one of the first signals that we probably want to start bringing them in or at least under cover so that we can be in control of how much moisture the plant's getting. That constant rain is not going to be its favorite environment. And then before we have our first frost, that plant would need to come indoors. The Christmas cactus, Easter cactus, Thanksgiving cactus, collectively and lovingly referred to as zygo cactus, Z like Z, zygo cactus. This, for example, is um, just an un, uh, unholiday affiliated zygo cactus. Don't know who he is um, on the tag. Zygo cactus. It says it's white. This is a white one. The foliage on a zygo cactus is is there. Uh, it's not exactly like colorful or brilliant or beautiful, but they do grow into these, you know, long trailing, pretty significantly sized plants. They can live for generations, which means that you might have your grandmother's or your grandchild might get yours. They um, can be divided. So you can split them up into multiple, you know, as they grow, you can divide them out and share them with family members. The plant itself definitely benefits from being outdoors in the summer months just to grow bigger and um, what it seems to do is it kind of helps the plant feel the change when you bring it in before Halloween. So it feels the change in light conditions from being outdoors to now having less light indoors and some temperature changes that it gets a chance to feel outside before you bring it in and give it more like consistent indoor temperatures. When it feels that change, it's like, oh, Christmas is coming. Some of you I know are like that too. I can't stand you people, but it's excited for the bloom season. And as soon as it feels that like little chill to the air, it's like my time is coming and it starts setting those flower buds. So bringing that cactus uh, or zygo cactus out and then in can sometimes be all you need to do to stimulate it to flower. And if you've had trouble getting one to rebloom on your own um, in the past, do as I say, and you should probably have high success. And it's not too late, put it outside right now. But if you're gonna take an indoor plant and put it outside right now in 96 degrees or whatever it's gonna be for the next week or so, you've gotta do it slowly You've got to put it out in the shade. It's still bright light, probably considered, uh, you know, in comparison to your home. Put it out in bright, indirect light and slowly move it out into the full sun over the course of several days or a week to acclimate it to being out in direct light. 
it still might even get a sunburn. I mean, I do. Um, so, you know, that's going to happen potentially, but it's also going to color it brilliantly and give you um, a more attractive plant when you bring it back inside. Now, this zygo cactus, as beautiful as it is from this side, has a sad backside. Um, and the sad backside is actually a rotten piece. So if you look inside the pot, it's got multiple cuttings that are growing. I think originally it might have been three cuttings, but this third cutting looks, so everybody else is like shiny and plump, no shrivels, no wrinkles. And then the one that was sad looking was wrinkled and shrivelly and wilty and at the base it was even kind of soft and discolored. Now the soil in this particular hanging basket right now is very wet. Very wet for a succulent um, but the other two guys are doing fine. This particular cutting uh, definitely has experienced a root rot. So we've just removed one piece of this hanging basket and we expect that the rest of it is going to do fine, but we need to monitor watering right now knowing that we potentially have um, a situation on our hands. <clears throat> I would also consider repotting on this one. If I look at the soil, look at the soil in here. All of those little strings, that's coca coir. Uh, the coconut coir, this is a really water holding mix. In fact, you can see how wet it is just by seeing it ball up in my hands. So like peat moss, coconut coir can hold a lot of water. Um, why do growers put cactus in soil that holds a lot of water? I don't know. Um, they're trying to be efficient with using one soil for everything, I suppose. But this would be a situation where I would e evaluate the soil that my succulent's in and especially after a root rot, I would highly consider repotting and using a more appropriate soil. Not necessarily going bigger. I don't need to go bigger. In fact, I might go smaller now that I have a third less plant. But changing the soil from this water holding, oh my gosh. Oh. I don't know if you saw that, but I just squeezed water out of this. So um, this water holding soil, I didn't even think it would do that. That was cool. Uh, Switching it out with something that's not going to squeeze dirt out like or squeeze soil out of the dirt like that could make a big difference in life or death in the long term and just your ability to water it right. You know, I mean, it's hard enough to get the hang of it, letting something dry out, getting it wet enough, weighing it, feeling it, touching it, sticking a stick in there or your finger or whatever. But if you've got the wrong kind of soil, then you're doubly handicapped um, to begin with. So all of these things are critical. It's hard to say what's the most important, but um, I, hopefully you're still with me. <clears throat> now, flowering, okay, we kind of talked about that. Pests and diseases. Well, diseases, uh, root rot is like disease number one. We just saw that. Um, occasionally we can see leaf spots and some other, um, maybe powdery mildew from time to time on some of the succulents. And a lot of that has to do with high humidity. So if you've got uh, the habit of like spraying all your plants, if you're misting your succulent, thinking that you're doing a great job, um, stop. That is adding too much moisture on their leaves, which then can cause them to come down with fungal problems. If you are um, watering them with an ice cube, again, stop. Um, I've, that seems to be some weird trick that people do with Trader Joe's orchids. If it works for you, I guess you're lucking out, but an ice cube sitting on the soil or potentially next to a succulent could um, freeze the stem, rot it out by just sitting there too long instead of water that drains through quickly. So we don't want to give our plants tiny sips. You know, if you think, well, he doesn't like to be very wet. So I'm going to give it a cap full of water from my water bottle every day. How about that? Is that fine? No, because again, your plant's not getting ever thoroughly hydrated. 
and it's not getting a chance then to like go dry enough in between waterings. Think desert rainstorm. Give it a desert rainstorm and then be gone from the clouds, you know, be a clear, clear blue sky for the next 30, 60, 90 days. Diseases tend to be associated with humidity and watering. Pests, pests just come from like who knows where. Pests are just there. Pests can come in on the dog, on you, on another plant. Um, those of us that have succulents and cactus probably also have other plants. Pests can find their way to our plants and they can be sneaky and hide from us. They can um, not even resemble an insect, which that's a scale, a scale pest. Doesn't even really, there's a life cycle form, there's a form, uh, hmm. there's a point in its life cycle where scale don't even have legs. They just, they look like a scab on the plant that you could just kind of pick off. But they're sitting there sucking the juices of the plant. Mealybug is another pest that um, hides on the undersides of our, of our uh, leaves usually, or in cactus and succulents case, down in cracks and crevices of the plants or right where a leaf meets the stem, that's where the little pest is gonna be. Sneaky, hiding, quiet, hard to see. And in a mealybug's case, it kinda looks like dust or fluff or I don't know what, but I've got a good example here. And yeah, look closely, that's a bug. Well, that's a couple of bugs. So mealybug here is this white cottony, ooh, it's on my fingers now, white cottony pest. We see, those are larger ones. We see a smaller, there we go. We see some smaller mealybugs along the stem here. This happens to be a Hoya, which mealybugs are also very fond of. So mealybugs like succulents, generally, they like plants with that kind of thick fleshy leaf although there are other plants they like too. But mealybugs are important to recognize, know how to spot them. Again, looking on the undersides, looking in those little kind of um, stem joints, and mealybugs can be treated with insecticidal soap or with neem oil. And either one of these is probably something that you should have in your um, kind of solutions cabinet just in case. Insecticidal soap is also effective on um, aphids, spider mites, a lot of other insects. And neem oil has uh, preventative qual qualities for diseases and fungal problems, as well as insecticide and miticide properties. But both of these, neem oil specifically, it's, it's important to just kind of know how the, how the product works and to be familiar with it in relation to the plant that you're gonna spray it on. This little, um, well, it's called Happy Young Lady. I, I don't know why. This particular, this is a crass, or a cotyledon, and you see how blue, how kind of shiny blue gray it is. Well, this blue gray is actually a wax. If you see, I'm gonna wipe it off with my finger. So that wax on the outer coating of the leaf is another way that it's sealing in moisture and that's like sunscreen. That wax is like sunscreen. <clears throat> but anything that has that wax can be broken down. The wax itself is broken down by neem oil. So when you spray your waxy gray, silver bluish gray plant with neem oil, you will lose the coloration and now it's green and it will slowly change back as it develops that wax layer again, but it's not going to just like go back to what it looked like when it was dry. Um, so just like carpet cleaner, just like stain remover, you know, try it on a lower leaf first to see what it's going to do uh, before you go ahead and just broadcast spray the whole plant. Because we have options, neem oil or insecticidal soap, we can use insecticidal soap on the gray or silver gray plants or blue gray and have less of a permanent effect on that wax layer. The oil just breaks the wax down. <clears throat> uh, let's see, soil, pot size. P 
pot size, keep it small. In almost all cases, succulents, cactus, we want shallow so that they're not deeply rooted plants in the first place. They make a big tap root. We want um, the shallow pot to not hold as much water basically as a deeper pot would, especially if there aren't roots in them. So a little dish, we have these kind of fun, narrow dishes, which are just perfect for putting a little assortment of like two inch succulents into, just the right depth for them. If we were gonna put a bigger plant in here, uh, we'd have to either shave off some of the bottom of the soil or find a bigger pot for it instead. Um, but again, a little shallow bowl or tray is great. And the rough terracotta, <clears throat> the rough clay is ideal rather than a very highly glazed pot. Rough clay surfaces allow moisture to evaporate from the walls of the container. So just assists the plant in drying out its soil <clears throat> between waterings and giving a little bit more air to the root system through that rough clay as opposed to a, um, <coughs> a glazed ceramic. <clears throat> Propagation. Now, or making more succulents or more cactus is really one of the like fun and easy and I think part of the appeal of cactus and succulents other than <clears throat> I mean they're really cool to look at and they have such varied shapes and textures and colors they are easy to grow they are easy to grow new ones from old ones and part of their nature in general is that they tend to be brittle. Something like the watch chain crassula here. As we take it out of, the plant, out of the pot, as we repot it, pieces of it might break off. In fact, it's easy to kind of see how pieces break off. But the brittle nature of many of these succulents is what allows a new piece that falls on the ground to grow roots and then propagate itself into a whole new plant. So we go back to shade here. Which one? Oh, here it is. If we go back to this beautiful variegated jade and that leaf that was sitting down in the bottom of the pot, it was just sitting down here. It fell off. There's another one that's broken that'll fall off here in time. It fell off. No one buried it. Remember, it just fell off. It laid right down, not even fully on the soil because it's got this little J curve. So that J hold, held its uh, end where it was attached to the stem just above the soil, but the little end sensed moisture, sensed the soil down below and began to grow roots. As soon as it grows roots, it also starts putting up tiny little plantlets that'll become all, well, it's not this variety, but will grow up to become all new little baby jades, just like these guys here. <clears throat> and you can see in the red jade, in the base of the container, where some leaves have already fallen and started to sprout their own new plants. Now over time, the leaf that fell is going to shrivel up and rot away. And in time, by the time it does that, these roots will be down into the soil and the rest of the plant will begin to grow on its own roots. This leaf that it all came from is like a lunchbox or a battery for the new plant. And as it uses it up, as you see, it's getting uh, soft and squishy. But as long as it doesn't rot before the roots touch down, this plant will then be able to survive on its own and the leaf that it came from will just kind of uh, rot away and feed the soil so that that decomposing leaf creates a little bit of nutrition for that young plant to feed off. Pretty cool. Um, and that's really like all of these succulents can do just that. Occasionally the leaf falls, 
and rots first. So this is just a shriveled up leaf. Not every leaf is gonna grow into a new plant. Also, occasionally a leaf is broken off. Where did I see that? Uh, without getting the whole leaf where it's attached to the stem. So if you don't get the growth node, it won't give you roots. If it's like broken or damaged as it comes off, then that's just gonna be a damaged leaf and get rid of it. But as, as it comes off clean on the stem with the node, you will get a new growth even from a little calancho like this. In fact, here's a fun example of if you took a leaf off of this guy and let it grow over time, this is what the young baby is gonna come up and start looking like. So youngsters can look a little bit different from the adults, but as they grow, obviously they um, start taking on the, the characteristics of a mature plant. <clears throat> there are outdoor winter hardy succulents that here in Oregon you can grow without taking all of the, you know, bring it in by October and worry about its drainage. I mean, we want it to be in good drainage um, and bright light, but we have a really great range, a very attractive. These are hens and chicks, um, also known as Semper vivum. These are the outdoor hardy succulents that uh, have a fun little, this guy's got a great flower. The kind of these particular two I'm holding have a little bit of a fuzz over the top of them. Kind of looks like the, a spider has had a little party webbing up the tips of each plant. But that, again, is just another way that they stay drought tolerance with all that fuzz and hair on them. This is a, another very cool variety of hens and chicks. It's called oddity because uh, each of the leaves is kind of rolled up to almost make like a hollow center. Oddity and these others I just showed you and then another beauty here. This is lime twister This is a sedum sun sparkler version lime twister hardy drought tolerant very colorful and beautiful Zone 9 uh, is the kind of end of the plants happiness, but zone 4 is as cold as these guys can take so zone 4 is like I think, again, Minnesota, very, very cold, very tough when it comes to winter conditions, as long as it's not wet and cold at the same time. Uh, let's see, propagation, resting period. You can look at that kind of on the handout. Fire sticks here is another great, this is a euphorbia. Not really a succulent, not really a cactus, but just in with all of them. Euphorbia fire sticks is another one that um, we see kind of grown indoors, but the, the name, the fire in the fire sticks comes from the bright, bright light that can stimulate that kind of pink and almost orangish and red sometimes coloring on the plant. So the amount of sunlight, direct sunlight even that it receives is going to make it brighter and brighter colored. In fact, I've been talking to a few people recently that had fire sticks and they bring them inside and they really just all go green or yellow green. Um, this is another great plant to take outside for summer to get at that tan, get it to color up so that then when you bring it back in the house, um, that color is going to hold as long as possible. Uh, I think I'm going to call it. I think we've covered it today. If we look here at... I wanted it to hydrate a little bit faster, but if we look back at my little um, succulent that's been sitting in the bottom watering container, it's not, I wouldn't say that the leaves are like any less shriveled. They still have a shriveled look, so it takes time, but we can take it out of the pot and see how far up the root ball, it has absorbed moisture now. We still need to get it a little bit more hydrated so that it's as thoroughly wetted as possible. So I'll put it back in the drink for just a little bit longer and it feels heavier. So that's another good indication that the soil is absorbing the water that we've given it. Last thing I did promise to show you was how to touch and handle a spiny cactus. Yes. So uh, here I have, I wouldn't have remembered if I hadn't had my little wadded up paper towel. 
You don't need anything fancy or fancy tools. Although I'm sure there's some really fancy tools out there to do this, but a couple layers of paper towel. I just had towels and I folded them into a little thin strip like so. I did a better job with this one, but <clears throat> it's like two layers thick folded um, into a triangle, kind of like a handkerchief and then folded, folded, folded. Now I've got this nice thick band and this nice thick band is what's going to allow me to wrap it around the spines here, take it to the end and twist your ends just a couple times to tighten it. And now I can grab the whole cactus out. My fingers are safe. I can put it into, for example, whoop, whoop, add a little bit of soil into the bottom, hold it in here as I add more soil around it, delicately finish my planting, and then untwist. Ta-da! No band-aids. Um, and even though maybe this looks clean and um, safe to like, whew, now wipe your forehead, throw it away. You got spines in there um, and it's better to be in your paper towel than in your fingers. If you're using a larger cactus, maybe a barrel cactus, something with more girth than paper towels are going to service, think an old pair of denim jeans, same thing. Lay those legs out, wrap them up, Take a nice belt to secure around your cactus or another thicker piece of fabric that you'll be able to do a similar job with. Canvas is another great one to use. There are gloves that are um, thorn proof, but I usually find that by the time I'm trying to, you know, scoop soil and finesse the pot and I, I want to take the gloves off anyway. So um, in case again, you aren't getting cactus gloves just for one time that you're going to repot your cactus, there's another workaround. And with that, now your fingers are safe, my fingers are safe. Everyone have a great time with your succulents and cactus. And as always, thanks for watching. Happy gardening.